Hi, Dr. Borat. It was wonderful listening to you break out all the important discussions from ASH. The one particular study that's, of course, uh, garnering the maximum attention would be the one from the plenary today with azacitid and venetoclax compared to 7 plus 3 in relatively younger fit individuals and promising even free survival and complete re response rates, CRCRIs altogether. How do you think that's going to change the AML treatment journey moving forward in young fit patients, of course, those who are not FLIT3, ITD, and PM1? And what do you think could be the challenges in adopting ASAVEN in younger patients? I think that those are excellent questions. So as you as you rightly mentioned, this is not for favorable risk patients. So not core binding factor, not NPM1, not FLT3. This is for patients that are young, fit, as we call transplant eligible. They have the potential to go to transplant. But overall, their AML is intermediate, but really high risk. These are patients that traditionally would not have done very well with intensive chemotherapy, but got all the toxicities of intensive sure. chemotherapy, which is what the study showed. These patients ended up in the ICU more, they had more toxicity. So the study essentially said, hey, it doesn't matter how you get them to a CR if you can protect their health, protect their performance status, as long as you get them to transplant. So I think the key takeaway from the study is you can use ASA then in younger, fitter patients, that are high risk as long as you can take them to transplant. Right. I think one of the important things that was missing in the presentation today, and I understand that they, that's being worked upon, is the MRD rate right. and both the arms. So do you think if MRD is an important endpoint in acute myeloid leukemia, MRD could be considered an endpoint and subsequent transplant thereafter, and whatever path is taken to reach that MRD negative is not as relevant? I think you're right. I, I can, I can to definitely see how that could biologically be relevant because we do know that MRD positive disease is much more high risk than MRD negative. And does it matter if you get to your destination one way or the other, or as long as you get there in good shape and then you can take the next journey? So I really think that that's going to be key. And as you said, we don't have that data yet. Another question that comes to my mind and that's taking from the discussion uh, you and Dr. Uh... Cortez just had now was specifically for IDH1 mutated patients. We know if we compare the Agile and the VLA-8 trial, the patients who have IDH1 mutated AML, at least on the Agile trial, did it significantly better than a cross-cross trial comparison with VLA-A. Putting that context into the ASA plus VIN and the 7 plus 3 data, do you think that we would be under-treating the IDH1 or they're probably not getting the best optimum treatment? if they are on ASAVEN? That's a great question. I think if you look at kind of what happens to IDH1 patients with ASAVEN versus, as you said, ASA-IVO and Agile, I agree that if you look at the ASA-IVO data, they seem to do better, um, they have less toxicity, and they overall, you know, survival, you know, is, is improved. So I think it just depends on what your goal is. If your goal is not to go to transplant and this is for transplant ineligible patients, I agree, you know, ASA IVO is, is the way to go because you avoid a lot of the ASA then toxicities. I think if your goal is to ultimately get to transplant, ASA then will get you there faster. Your response rates will happen in the course couple of cycles. So I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong answer in terms of what therapy you pick. Right. The other point I want to discuss with you and certainly it's probably hot cake in leukemia is the use of triplets. There are so many inhibitors now, IDH inhibitors, FLIT3, and certainly menin inhibitors, which are coming in a big way. Then there are several other innovator molecules like CD123 was discussed today, uh, gamma delta activators were discussed. But with respect to the drugs which have really moved forward in the research arena with ASA plus venous combination, one important consideration is added toxicity to ASA plus ven. And even with drugs like FLIT3 inhibitors, which have shown reasonably good outcomes. Mm. When you're treating such patients in the hospital and even in other community setups, how do you decide about reducing the dose of venetoclax? At what point would you be worried that waiting for count recovery and subsequent too much of splicing of cycles might actually lead to treatment resistance? I think that's a, that's a very important dilemma that we have. I've had patients do multiple bone marrow biopsies because of exactly this 
where I didn't know if it was from cytopenias, from the treatment, from holding the treatment, from the disease. Um, I, I don't think there's a great answer. I think we're still learning how to dose reduce ASA then to keep the disease under control and not, you know, let it relapse, but also, you know, not cause too many cytopenias by overdoing the ven. And I think it's it's a it's sort of like the art of medicine that sure. we're doing right now. Before I end, I want to ask one question, and I know you have been very, uh, very much involved in the development of the frontline ASA ven revumenib, which is published now in GCO, and we showed some of our data at this ash. The subset of patients with NPM1 mutated AML, they don't seem to be doing as good with frontline menin inhibitor, even if we compare just the doublet of ASA plus VEN. Does it mean that the triplet is adding to more toxicity or maybe ASA plus VEN is too good enough already for NPM1 mutated AML and we should keep these agents for later on as they relapse, etc.? I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that's what the community of AML, you know, physicians is concerned about, that are we adding something to an already excellent treatment? And then, as you said, what you're doing is just increasing the toxicity. And that, that's why you're not seeing the good outcomes you would expect to see if you add one more active agent, right? If you think of the myeloma paradigm. Um, and so I, I think that's why we need these studies. I think that's why we need randomized control studies, because if your control arm and your treatment arm are the same or your treatment arm is worse, I think you answered your question. Right. Dr. Borat, for patients who do not have targetable mutations and they are not eligible for intensive chemotherapy, how do you think beyond ASA plus when the field would progress? There is a huge cohort of patients with secondary type biology where we cannot really target them with anything. And CPX is a wonderful agent for sure, but CPX could also get too toxic for patients north of 70 years of age. How do you treat these patients in your clinic? I think that's where you mentioned, you know, CD123 targeting patients. You know, PBEC was something that was discussed. I think maybe finding targets like that, that are essentially mutationally agnostic, could be a really good option for these patients. So we'll have to see. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.